Books for Tired Eyes by Arthur E. Bostwick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Books for Tired Eyes. The most distinctive thing about a book is the possibility that someone may read it. Is this a truism? Evidently not. For the publishers who print books, and the libraries which store and distribute them, have never thought it worth their while to collect and record information bearing on this possibility. In the publishers or the booksellers' advertising announcements, as well as on the catalogue cards stored in the library's trays, the reader may ascertain when and where the book was published, the number of pages, and whether it contains plates or maps not a word of the size or style of type in which it is printed yet on this depends the ability of the reader to use the book for the purpose for which it was intended the old-fashioned reader was a mild-mannered gentleman if he could not read his book because it was printed in outrageously small type he laid it aside with a sigh or used a magnifying lens or persisted in his attempts with the naked eye until eye strain with its attendant maladies was the result lately however the libraries have been waking up and their readers with them the utilitarian side of the work is pushed to the front and the reader is by no means disposed to accept what may be offered him except in the content of the book or its physical make-up the modern library must adapt itself to its users and among other improvements must come an attempt to go as far as possible in making books physiologically readable. Unfortunately, the library cannot control the output of books, and must limit itself to selection. An experiment in such selection is now in progress in the St. Louis Public Library. The visitor to that library will find in its open shelf room a section of shelving marked with the words, Books in Large Type. To this section are directed all readers who have found it difficult or painful to read the ordinary printed page, but who do not desire to wear magnifying lenses. It has not been easy to fill these shelves, for books in large type are few, and hard to secure, despite the fact that artists, printers, and oculists have for years been discussing the proper size, form, and grouping of printed letters from their various standpoints. Perhaps it is time to urge a new view, that of the public librarian, anxious to please his clients and to present literature to them in that physical form which is most easily assimilable and least harmful. Tired eyes belong, for the most part, to those who have worked them hardest, that is, to readers who have entered upon middle age or have already passed through it. At this age we become conscious that the eye is a delicate instrument a fact which however familiar to us in theory has previously been regarded with aloofness now it comes home to us the length of a sitting the quality quantity and incidence of the light and above all the arrangement of the printed page become matters of vital importance to us a book with small print or letters illegibly grouped or of unrecognizable shapes becomes as impossible to us as if it were printed in the Chinese character. It is an unfortunate law of nature that injurious acts appear to us in their true light only after the harm is done. The burnt child dreads the fire after he has been burned, not before. So the fact that the middle-aged man cannot read small or crooked or badly grouped type means simply that the harmfulness of these things, which always existed for him, has accumulated throughout a long tale of years until it has obtruded itself upon him in the form of an inhibition. The books that are imperative for the tired eyes of middle age are equally necessary for those of youth. Did youth but know it? Curiously enough, we are accustomed to begin in teaching the young to read with very legible type. When the eyes grow stronger, we begin to maltreat them. So it is also with the digestive organs, which we first coddle with pack, then treat a while with pork and cocktails, and then perforce entertain with pap of the second and final period. What correspond in the field of vision to pork and cocktails are the vicious specimens of typography offered on all sides to readers, 
in books, pamphlets, magazines, and newspapers. Typography that is slowly but surely ruining the eyesight of those that need it most. Hitherto, the public librarian has been more concerned with the minds and the morals of his clientele than with that physical organism without which neither mind nor morals would be of much use. It would be easy to pick out on the shelves of almost any public library books that are a physiological scandal printed in type that is an outrage to place before any self-respecting reader. I have seen copies of Tom Jones that I should be willing to burn, as did a puritanical British library board of newspaper notoriety. My reasons, however, would be typographic, not moral, and I might want to add a few copies of The Pilgrim's Progress and The Saint's Everlasting Rest without prejudice to the author's share in those works, which I admire and respect. Perhaps it is too much to ask for complete typographical expurgation of our libraries, but, at least, readers with tired eyes who do not yet wear, or care to wear, corrective lenses should be able to find somewhere on the shelves a collection of works in relatively harmless print, large and black, clear in outline, simple and distinctive in form, properly grouped and spaced. The various attempts to standardise type sizes and to adopt a suitable notation for them have been limited hitherto to the sizes of the type body and bear only indirectly on the size of the actual letter more or less arbitrary names such as minion bourgeois brevier and non pareil were formerly used but what is called the point system is now practically universal although its unit the point is not everywhere the same roughly speaking a point is one seventy-second of an inch so that in three-point type for example the thickness of the type body from the top to the bottom of the letter on its face is one twenty-fourth of an inch but on this type body the face may be large or small although of course it cannot be larger than the body and the size of the letters called by precisely the same name in the point notation may vary within pretty wide limits there is no accepted notation for the size of the letters themselves and this fact tells more eloquently than words that the present sizes of type are standardized and defined for compositors only not for readers and still less for scientific students of the effect upon the reader's eyes of different arrangements of the printed page. What seems to have been the first attempt to define sizes of type suitable for school grades was made 15 years ago by Mr. Edward R. Shaw in his School Hygiene. He advocates sizes from 18 point in the first year to 12 point for the fourth principals teachers and school superintendents he said should possess a millimetre measure and a magnifying glass and should subject every book presented for their examination to a test to determine whether the size of the letters and the width of the leading are of such dimensions as will not prove injurious to the eyes of children to this list librarians might be well added not to speak of authors editors and publishers in a subsequent part of his chapter on eyesight and hearing from which the above sentence is quoted appears a test of illumination suggested by the medical record of strasburg which may serve as a horrid example in some such way as did the drunken brother who accompanied the temperance lecturer according to this authority if a pupil is unable to read diamond type four and one half point at twelve inch distance and without strain the illumination is dangerously low. The adult who tries the experiment will be inclined to conclude that whatever the illumination, the proper place for the man who uses diamond type for any purpose is the penitentiary. The literature upon this general subject, such as it is, is concerned largely with its relations with school hygiene. We are bound to give our children a fair start in life, in conditions of vision as well as in other respects, even if we are careless about ourselves the topic of conservation of vision in which however type size played but a small part was given special attention at the fourth international congress of school hygiene held in buffalo in nineteen thirteen investigations on the subject so far as they affect the child in school are well summed up in the last chapter of huey's psychology and pedagogy of reading 
in general the consensus of opinion of investigators seems to be that the most legible type is that between eleven point and fourteen point opinion regarding space between lines due to leading is not quite so harmonious some authorities think that it is better to increase the size of the letters and huey asserts that an attempt to improve unduly small type by making wide spaces between lines is a mistake as to the relative legibility of different typefaces one of the most exhaustive investigations was that made at clark university by miss barbara e rufflin whose results were published in nineteen twelve this study considers questions of form style and grouping independently of mere size and the conclusion is that legibility is a product of six factors of which size is one the others being form heaviness of face width of the margin around the letter position in the letter group and shape and size of adjoining letters for tired eyes the size factor would appear of overwhelming importance except where the other elements make the page fantastically illegible in miss rothlin's tables based upon a combination of the factors mentioned above the maximum of legibility almost always coincides with that of size these experiments seem to have influenced printers whose organization in boston has appointed a committee to urge upon the carnegie institution the establishment of a department of research to make scientific tests of printing types in regard to the comparative legibility and the possibility of improving some of their forms their effort so far has met with no success but the funds at the disposal of this body could surely be put to no better use with regard to the improvement of legibility by alteration of form it has been recognized by experiments from the outset that the letters of our alphabet especially the small or lower case letters are not equally legible many proposals for modifying or changing them have been made some of them odd or repugnant it has been suggested for instance that the greek lambda be substituted for our l which in its present form is easily confused with the dotted i other pairs of letters u and n o and e for example are differentiated with difficulty the privilege of modifying alphabetic form is one that has been frequently exercised the origin of the german alphabet and our own for instance is the same and no lower case letters in any form date further back than the middle ages there could be no well-founded objection to any change in the interests of legibility that is not so far-reaching as to make the whole alphabet look foreign and unfamiliar it may be queried however whether the lower-case alphabet had not better be reformed by abolishing it altogether there would appear to be no good reason for using two alphabets now one and now the other according to arbitrary rules difficult to learn and hard to remember that the general legibility of books would benefit by doing away with this medieval excrescence appears to admit of no doubt although the proposal may seem somewhat startling to the general reader in nineteen eleven a committee was appointed by the british association for the advancement of science to inquire into the influence of school books upon eyesight this committee's report dwells on the fact that the child's eye is still in process of development and needs larger type than the fully developed eye of the adult in making its recommendation for the standardization of school book type which it considers the solution of the difficulty the committee emphasizes the fact that forms and sizes most legible for isolated letters are not necessarily so for the groups that need to be quickly recognized by the trained reader it dwells upon the importance of unglazed paper flexible sewing clear bold illustrations black ink and true alignment condensed or compressed letters are condemned as are long serifs and hair strokes on the other hand very heavy face type is almost as objectionable as that with the fine lines the ideal being a proper balancing of whites and blacks in each letter and group the size of the typeface as we might expect is pronounced by the committee quote, the most important factor in the influence of books upon vision end quote. it describes its recommended sizes in millimeters a refinement which for the purposes of this article need not be insisted upon 
Briefly, the sizes run from 30 point for 7 year old children to 10 point or 11 point for persons more than 12 years old. Except as an inference from this last recommendation, the committee, of course, does not exceed its province by treating of type sizes for adults. Yet it would seem that it considers 10 point as the smallest size fit for anyone, however good his sight. This would bar much of our existing reading matter. A writer whose efforts in behalf of sane typography have had practical results is Professor Koopman, librarian of Brown University, whose plea has been addressed chiefly to printers. Professor Koopman dwells particularly on the influence of short lines on legibility. The eye must jump from the end of each line back to the beginning of the next, and this jump is shorter and less fatiguing with the shorter line, though it must be oftener performed. Owing largely to this demonstration, the Printing Art, a trade magazine published in Cambridge, Massachusetts, has changed its makeup from a one column to a two column page. It should be noted, however, that a uniform standard length of line is even more to be desired than a short one. When the eye has become accustomed to one length for its linear leaps, these leaps can be performed with relative ease and can be taken care of subconsciously. When the lengths vary capriciously from one book or magazine to another, or even from one page to another, as they so often do, the effort to get accustomed to the new length is more tiring than we realise. Probably this factor, next to the size of type, is most effective in tiring the middle-aged eye, and in keeping it tired. The opinion may be ventured that the reason for our continued toleration of the small type used in the daily newspapers is that their columns are narrow, and still more, that these are everywhere of practically uniform width. The indifference of publishers to the important feature of the physical makeup of books appears from the fact that in not a single case is it included among the descriptive items in their catalogue entries. Libraries are in precisely the same class of offenders. A reader or a possible purchaser of books is supposed to be interested in the fact that a book is published in Boston, has 432 pages, and is illustrated but not at all in its legibility. Neither publishers nor libraries have any way of getting information on the subject except by going to the books themselves. Occasionally, a remainder catalogue containing bargains whose charms it is desired to set forth with unusual detail states that a certain book is in large type, or even in fine large type, but these words are nowhere defined, and the purchaser cannot depend on their accuracy. An edition of Scott, recently advertised extensively as in large clear type, proved on examination to be printed in ten point. In gathering the large type collection for the St. Louis Library, fourteen point was decided upon as the standard, which means, of course, types with a face somewhere between the smallest size that is usually found on a fourteen point body, even if actually on a smaller body, and the largest that this can carry even if on a larger body. The latter is unusually large, but it would not do to place the standard below 14 point because that would lower the minimum, which is none too large as it is. The first effort was to collect such large type books already in the library as would be likely to interest the general reader. In the collection of nearly 400,000 volumes, it was found by diligent search that only 150 would answer this description. Most octavo volumes of travel are in large type, but only a selected number of these was placed in the collection to avoid overloading it with this particular class. This statement applies also to some other classes and to certain types of books, such as some government reports and some scientific monographs, which have no representatives in the group. The next step was to supplement the collection by purchase. All available publishers' catalogues were examined, but after a period of 12 months it was found possible to spend only $65 in the purchase of 120 additional books. A circular letter was then sent to 92 publishers, explaining the purpose of the collection and asking for information regarding books in 14-point type, or larger, issued by them. To these there were received 63 answers. 
In 29 instances, no books in type of this size were issued by the recipients of the circulars. In six cases, the answer included brief lists of from 2 to 12 titles of large type books, and in several other cases, the publishers stated that the labour of ascertaining which of their publications are in large type would be prohibitive, as it would involve actual inspection of each and every volume on their lists. In two instances, however, after a second letter, explaining further the aims of the collection, publishers promised to undertake the work. The final result has been that the library now has over 400 volumes in the collection. This is surely not an imposing number, but it appears to represent the available resources of a country in which 1,000 publishers are annually issuing 11,000 volumes, to say nothing of the British and continental output. In the list of the collection and in the entries, the size of the type, the leading, and the size of the book itself are to be distinctly stated. The last mentioned item is necessary because the use of large type sometimes involves a heavy volume, awkward to hold in the hand. The collection for adults in the St. Louis Library, as it now exists, may be divided into the following classes according to the reasons that seem to have prompted the use of large type. 1. Large books printed on a somewhat generous scale and intended to sell at a high price, the size of the type being merely incidental to this plan. These include books of travel, history, or biography in several volumes, somewhat high-priced sets of standard authors, and books intended for gifts. 2. Books containing so little material that large type, thick paper, and wide margins were necessary to make a volume easy to handle and use. These include many short stories of magazine length, which for some inscrutable reason are now often issued in separate form. 3. Books printed in large type for aesthetic reasons. These are few, beauty and artistic form being apparently linked in some way with illegibility by many printers, no matter what the size of the typeface. The large type collection is used not only by elderly persons, but also in greater number by young persons whose oculists forbid them to read fine print, or who do not desire to wear glasses. The absence of a wide range in the collection drives others away to books that are, doubtless, in many cases bad for their eyes. Some books that have not been popular in the general collection have done well here, while old favourites have not been taken out. Such facts as these mean little with so limited a collection. Until readers awake to the dangers of small print and the comfort of large type, there will not be sufficient pressure on our publishers to induce them to put forth more books suitable for tired eyes. It is probably too much to expect that the trade itself will try to push literature whose printed form obeys the rules of ocular hygiene. All that we can reasonably ask is that type size shall be reported on in catalogues, so that those who want books in large type may know what is obtainable and where to go for it. It has often been noted that physicians are the only class of professional men whose activities, if properly carried on, tend directly to make the profession unnecessary. Medicine tends more and more to be preventive rather than curative. We must therefore look to the oculists to take the first steps towards lessening the number of their prospective patients by inculcating rational notions about the effects of the printed page on the eye. Teachers, librarians, parents, the press, all can do their part. And when a demand for larger print has thus been created, the trade will respond. Meanwhile, libraries should be unremitting in their efforts to ascertain what material in large type already exists to collect it and to call attention to it in every legitimate way end of books for tired eyes by arthur e bostwick a chapter of things to see this fall by dallas lore sharp this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Berard. A Chapter of Things to See This Fall 
by dallas lord sharp one you ought to see the sky every day you ought to see as often as possible the breaking of dawn the sunset the moonrise and the stars go up to your roof if you live in the city or out into the middle of the park or take a street-car ride into the edge of the country just to see the moon come up over the woods or over a rounded hill against the sky two you ought to see the light of the october moon as it falls through a roof of leafless limbs in some silent piece of woods you have seen the woods by daylight you have seen the moon from many places but to be in the middle of the moonlit woods after the silence of the october frost has fallen is to have one of the most beautiful experiences possible out of doors three you ought to see a wooded hillside in the glorious colors of the fall the glowing hickories the deep flaming oaks the cool dark pines the blazing gums and sumacs take some single particular woodland scene and look at it until you can see it in memory forever four you ought to see the spiders in their airships sailing over the autumn meadows take an indian summer day lazy hazy sunny and lie down on your back in some small meadow where woods or old rail fences hedge it around lie so that you do not face the sun the sleepy air is heavy with balm and barely moves soon shimmering billowing through the light a silky skein of cobweb will come floating over look sharply and you will see the little aeronaut swinging in his basket at the bottom of the balloon sail sail away in the air air far are the shores of anywhere over the woods and the heather five you ought to see only see mind you on one of those autumn nights when you have not on your party clothes you ought to see a wood pussy a wood pussy is not a house pussy a wood pussy is a wood pussy that is to say a wood pussy is a skunk yes you ought to see a skunk walking calmly along a moonlit path and not caring a fig for you you will perhaps never meet a wild buffalo or a grizzly bear or a jaguar in the woods nearest your house but you may meet a wild skunk there and have the biggest adventure of your life yes you ought to see a skunk some night just for the thrill of meeting a wild creature that won't get out of your way six you ought to see the witch hazel bush in blossom late in november it is the only bush or tree in the woods that is in full bloom after the first snow may have fallen many persons who live within a few minutes walk of the woods where it grows have never seen it but then many persons who live with the sky right over their heads with the dawn breaking right into their bedroom windows have never seen the sky or the dawn to think about them and wonder at them there are many persons who have never seen anything at all that is worth seeing the witch hazel bush all yellow with its strange blossoms in november is worth seeing worth taking a great deal of trouble to see there is a little flower in southern new jersey called pixie or flowering moss a very rare and hidden little thing and i know an old botanist who traveled five hundred miles just to have the joy of seeing that little flower growing in the sandy swamp along silver run if you have never seen the witch hazel in bloom it will pay you to travel five hundred and five miles to see it but you won't need to go so far unless you live beyond the prairies for the witch hazel grows from nova scotia to florida and west to minnesota and alabama there is one flower that according to mr john muir and he surely knows it will pay one to travel away up into the highest sierra to see 
it is the fragrant washington lily the finest of all the sierra lilies he says its bulbs are buried in shaggy chaparral tangles i suppose for safety from pawing bears and its magnificent panicles sway and rock over the top of the rough snow-pressed bushes while big bull blunt-nosed bees drone and mumble in its polygony bells a lovely flower worth going hungry and footsore endless miles to see the whole world seems richer now that i have found this plant in so noble a landscape and so it seemed to the old botanist who came five hundred miles to find the tiny pixie in the sandy swamps of southern new jersey so it will seem to you the whole world will not only seem richer but will be richer for you when you have found the witch hazel bush all covered with summer's gold in the bleak woods of november seven you ought to see a big pile of golden pumpkins in some farmhouse shed or beside the great barn door you ought to see a field of corn in the shop hay in a barn mow the jars of fruit the potatoes apples and great chunks of wood in the farmhouse cellar you ought to see how a farmer gets ready for the winter the comfort the plenty the sufficiency of it all eight you ought to see how the muskrats too get ready for the winter and the bees and the flowers and the trees and the frogs everything winter is coming the cold will kill if it has a chance but see how it has no chance how is it that the bees will buzz the flowers open the birds sing the frogs croak again next spring as if there had been no freezing killing weather go out and see why for yourselves nine you ought to see the tiny seed birds from the gray birches scattering on the autumn winds the thistledown too and a dozen other of the winged and plumed and ballooned seeds that sail on the wings of the winds you should see the burdock burrs in the cows tails when they come home from the pasture and the stick tights and beggar needles in your own coat tails when you come home from the pastures and seeing that you should think for that is what real seeing means think what why that you are just as good as a cow's tail to scatter nature's seeds for her and not a bit better as she sees you ten you want to see the migrating birds as they begin to flock on the telegraph wires in the chimneys and among the reeds of the river you ought to see the swallows blackbirds robins and bluebirds as they flock together for the long southern flight there are days in late september and in early october when the very air seems to be half birds going over birds diving and darting about you birds along the rails and ridge poles birds in the grass under your feet birds everywhere you should be out among them where you can see them and especially you should see without fail this autumn and every autumn the wedge of wild geese cleaving the dull gray sky in their thrilling journey down from the far-off frozen north end of a chapter of things to see this fall by dallas lore sharp Christ and Socrates by Jean Jacques Rousseau, seventeen twelve to seventeen seventy eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christ and Socrates. I will confess that the majority of the scriptures strikes me with admiration, as the purity of the gospel hath its influence on my heart. Peruse the works of our philosophers with all their pomp and diction. How mean, how contemptible are they compared with the scriptures? Is it possible that a book, at once so simple and sublime, should be merely the work of man? 
is it possible that the sacred personage whose history it contains should be himself a mere man do we find that he assumed the tone of an enthusiast or ambitious sectary what sweetness what purity in his manner what an affecting gracefulness in his delivery what sublimity in his maxims what profound wisdom in his discourses what presence of mind what subtlety what truth in his replies how great the command over his passions where is the man where the philosopher who could so live and so die without weakness and without ostentation when plato described his imaginary good man loaded with all the shame of guilt yet meriting the highest rewards of virtue he describes exactly the character of jesus christ the resemblance was so striking that all the fathers perceived it what prepossession what blindness must it be to compare the son of sophronicus to the son of mary what an infinite disproportion there is between them socrates dying without pain or ignominy easily supported his character to the last and if his death however easy had not crowned his life it might have been doubted whether socrates with all his wisdom was anything more than a vain sophist he invented it is said the theory of morals others however had before put them in practice he had only to say therefore what they had done and to reduce their examples to precepts aristides had been just before socrates defined justice leonides had given up his life for his country before socrates declared patriotism to be a duty the spartans were a sober people before socrates recommended sobriety before he had even defined virtue greece abounded in virtuous men but where could jesus learn among his competitors that pure and sublime morality of which he only hath given us both precept and example the greatest wisdom was made known amongst the most bigoted fanaticism and the simplicity of the most heroic virtues did honor to the vilest people on earth the death of socrates peaceably philosophizing with his friends appears the most agreeable that could be wished for that of jesus expiring in the midst of agonizing pains abused insulted and accused by a whole nation is the most horrible that could be feared socrates in receiving the cup of poison blessed indeed the weeping executioner who administered it but jesus in the midst of excruciating torments prayed for his merciless tormentors yes if the life and death of socrates were those of a sage the life and death of jesus are those of a god shall we suppose the evangelic history a mere fiction indeed my friend it bears not the marks of fiction on the contrary the history of socrates which nobody presumes to doubt is not so well attested as that of jesus christ such a supposition in fact only shifts the difficulty without obviating it it is more inconceivable that a number of persons should agree to write such a history than that one only should furnish the subject of it the jewish authors were incapable of the diction and strangers to the morality contained in the gospel the marks of whose truth are so striking and inimitable that the inventor would be a more astonished character than the hero end of christ and socrates by jean jacques rousseau seventeen twelve to seventeen seventy eight of the devil's head in the valley perilous 
and of the customs of folk in diverse isles that be about in the lordship of prester john from the travels of sir john mandeville thirteen hundred to thirteen seventy one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Beside that isle of Mistarac, upon the left side nigh to the river Pison, is a marvellous thing. There is a vale between the mountains that dureth nigh a four mile, and some men clepe it the vale enchanted, some clepe it the vale of devils, and some clepe it the vale perilous. In that vale men hear oft times great tempests and thunders, and great murmurs and noises all days and nights and great noise as it were sound of tabors and of nakers and of trumps as though it were of a great feast this vale is all full of devils and hath been always and men say there that it is one of the entries of hell in that vale is great plenty of gold and silver wherefore many misbelieving men and many christian men also go in often time for to have of the treasure that there is but few come again and namely of the misbelieving men nay of the christian men neither for anon they be strangled of devils and in mid place of that vale under a rock is a head and the visage of a devil bodily full horrible and dreadful to see and it showeth not but the head to the shoulders but there is no man in the world so hardy christian man nay other but that he should be a dread to behold it and that it would seem him to die for dread so is it hideous for to behold for he beholdeth every man so sharply with dreadful iron that be evermore moven and sparkling as fire and changeth and stirreth so often in diverse manner with so horrible countenance that no man dare not nigheth towards him and from him cometh out smoke and stinking fire and so much abomination that aneath no man may there endure but the good christian men that be stable in the faith enter well without peril for they will first drive them and mark them with the token of the holy cross so that the fiends may have no power over them but albeit that there be without peril yet natheless ne be they not without dread when that they see the devils visibly and bodily all about them that make full many diverse assaults and menaces in air and in earth and aghast them with strokes of thunder blasts and of tempests and the most dread is that god will take vengeance then of that that men have misdone against his will and ye shall understand that when my fellows and i were in that vale we were in great thought whether that we durst put our bodies in adventure to go in or not in the protection of god and some of our fellows accorded to enter and some not so there were with us two worthy men friars minor that were of lombardy that said that if any man would enter they would go in with us and when they had said so upon the gracious trust of god of them we let sing mass and made every man to be striven and household and then we entered fourteen persons but at our going out we were but nine and so we wist never that our fellows were lost or else turned again for dread but we saw them never after and those were two men of greece and three of spain and our other fellows that would not go in with us they went by another coast to be before us and so they were and thus we passed that perilous vale and found therein gold and silver and precious stones and rich jewels great plenty both here and there as us seemed but whether that it was as us seemed i wot never for i touched none because that the devils be so subtle to make a thing to seem otherwise than it is for to deceive mankind and therefore i touched none and also because that i would not be put out of my devotion for i was more devout then than ever i was before or after and all for the dread of fiends that i saw in diverse figures and also for the great multitude of dead bodies that i saw there lying by the way by all the vale as though there had been a battle between two kings and the mightiest of the country and that the great part had been discomfited and slain and i trow that aneath should any country have so many people within him as lay slain in that vale as us thought the which was an hideous sight to see 
and i marvelled much that there were so many and the bodies all whole without rotting but i trow that fiends made them seem to be so whole without rotting but that might not be to mine advice that so many should have entered so newly nay so many newly slain without stinking and rotting and many of them were in habit of christian men but i trow well that it were of such that went in for covetous of the treasure that was there and had overmuch feebleness in the faith so that their hearts nay might not endure in the belief for dread and therefore were we the more devout a great deal and yet we were cast down and beaten down many times to the hard earth by winds and thunders and tempests but evermore god of his grace hope us and so we passed that perilous vale without peril and without encumbrance thanked be almighty god after this beyond the vale is a great isle where the folk be great giants of twenty-eight foot long or of thirty foot long and they have no clothing but of skins of beasts that they hang upon them and they eat no bread but all raw flesh and they drink milk of beasts for they have plenty of all bestial and they have no houses to lie in for they eat more gladly men's flesh than any other flesh into that isle dare no man gladly enter for if they see a ship and men therein anon they enter into the sea for to take them and men said us that in an isle beyond that were giants of greater stature some of forty-five foot or of fifty foot long and as some men say some of fifty cubits long but i saw none of those for i had no lust to go to those parts because that no man cometh neither into that isle ne into the other but if it be devoured anon and among those giants be sheep as great as oxen here and they bear great wool and rough of the sheep i have seen many times and men have seen many times those giants take men in the sea out of their ships and brought them to land two in one hand and two in another eating them going all raw and all quick another isle is there towards the north in the sea ocean where that be full cruel and full evil women of nature and they have precious stones in their iron and they be of that kind that if they behold any man with wrath they slay him anon with the beholding as doth the basilisk another isle is there full fair and good and great and full of people where the custom is such that the first night that they be married they make another man to lie by their wives for to have their maidenhead and therefore they take great hire and great think and there be certain men in every town that serve of none other thing and they clep them cabaderas that is to say the fools of wanhope for they of the country hold it so great a thing and so perilous to have the maidenhead of a woman that them seemeth that they that have first the maidenhead putteth him in adventure of his life and if the husband find his wife maiden that other next night after she should have been lain by the man that is assigned therefore peradventure for drunkenness or for some other cause the husband shall plain upon him that he hath not done his devour in such cruel wise as though the officers would have slain him but after the first night that they be lain by they keep them straightly that they be not so hardy to speak with no man i asked them the cause why that they held such custom and they said me that of old time men had been dead for deflowering of maidens that had serpents in their bodies that stung men upon their yards that they died anon and therefore they held that customs to make other men ordained therefore to lie by their wives for dread of death and to assay the passage by another rather than for to put them in that adventure after that is another isle where that women make great sorrow when their children be ye born and when they die they make great feast and great joy and revel and then they cast them into a great fire burning and those that love well their husbands if their husbands be dead they cast them also in the fire with their children and burn them and they say that the fire shall cleanse them of all filths and of all vices and they shall go pured and clean into another world to their husbands and they shall lead their children with them and the cause why that they weep when their children be born is this that when they come into this world they come to labor sorrow and heaviness 
and why they make joy and gladness at their dying is because that as they say when they go to paradise where the rivers run milk and honey where that men see them in joy and in abundance of goods without sorrow and labour in that isle men make their king evermore by election and they may choose him not for no nobleness nor for no riches but such one as is of good manners and of good conditions and therewithal rightful and also that he be of great age and that he have no children in that isle men be full rightful and they do rightful judgments in every cause both of rich and poor small and great after the quantity of the trespass that is misdone and the king may not doom no man to death without assent of his barons and other men wise of counsel and that all the court accord thereto and if the king himself do any homicide or any crime as to slay a man or any such case he shall die therefore and he shall not be slain as another man but men shall defend in pain of death that no man be so hardy to make him company nay to speak with him nay that no man give him nay sell him nay serve him neither of meat nay of drink and so shall he die in mischief they spare no man that hath trespassed neither for love nay for favour nay for riches nay for nobleness but that he shall have after that he hath done beyond that isle is another isle where is great multitude of folk and they will not for no thing eat flesh of hares nay of hens nay of geese yet they bring forth enough for to see them and to behold them only but they eat flesh of all other beasts and drink milk in that country they take their daughters and their sisters to their wives and their other kinswomen and if there be ten men or twelve men or more dwelling in an house the wife of everich of them shall be common to all that dwell in that house so that every man may lie with whom he will of them on one night and with another another night and if she have any child she may give it to what man that she list that hath companied with her so that no man knoweth that whether the child be his or another's and if any man say to them that they nourish other men's children they answer that so do over men theirs in that country and by all end be great plenty of cockadrills that is the manner of a long serpent as i have said before and in the night they dwell in the water and on the day upon the land in rocks and in caves and they eat no meat in all the winter and they lie as in a dream as do the serpents these serpents slay men and they eat them weeping and when they eat they move the over jaw and not the nether jaw and they have no tongue in that country and in many other beyond that and also in many on this half men put in work the seed of cotton and they sow it every year and then groweth it in small trees that bear cotton and so do men every year so that there is plenty of cotton at all times item in this isle and in many other there is a manner of wood hard and strong whoso covereth the coals of that wood under the ashes thereof the coals will dwell and abide all quick a year or more and that tree hath many leaves as the juniper hath and there be also many trees that of nature they will never burn nay rot in no manner and there be nut trees that bear nuts as great as a man's head there also be many beasts that be clept oracles in arabia they be clept gerfonts that is a beast palmly or spotted but is but a little more high than is a steed but he hath a neck of twenty cubits long and his croup and his tail is as of an heart and he may look over a great high house and there be also in that country many camels that is a little beast as a goat that is wild and he liveth by the air and eateth none nay drinketh not at no time and he changeth his colour often times for men see him often scythes now in one colour and now in another and he may change him into all manner colours that him list save only into red and white there be also in that country passing great serpents some of six score foot long and they be of diverse colours as red red green and yellow blue and black and all speckled 
and there be others that have crests upon their heads and they go upon their feet upright and they be well a four fathom great or more and they dwell always in rocks or in mountains and they have always the throat open of whence they drop venom always and there be some wild swine of many colours as great as be oxen in our country and they be all spotted as be young fawns and there be also urchins as great as wild swine here we clep them porks de spine and there be lions all white great and mighty and there be also of other beasts as great and more greater than is a destrier and men clep them loranx and some men clep them odenthos and they have a black head and three long horns trenchant in the front sharp as a sword and the body is slender and he is a full felonious beast and he chaseth and slayeth the elephant there be also many other beasts full wicked and cruel that be not mickle more than a bear and they have the head like a boar and they have six feet and on every foot two large claws trenchant and the body is like a bear and the tail as a lion and there be also mice as great as hounds and yellow mice as great as ravens and there be geese all red three sizes more great than ours here and they have the head the neck and the breast all black and many other diverse beasts be in those countries and elsewhere thereabout and many diverse birds also of the which it were too long for to tell you and therefore i pass over at this time end of of the devil's head in the valley perilous and the customs of folk in diverse isles that be about the lordship of prester john by sir john mandeville thirteen hundred to thirteen seventy one The Eater of Dreams by Lafgario Hearn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Roy. The Eater of Dreams by Lafgario Hearn. Mejika yo ya, baku no yume ku. Hima mo nashi. Alas, how short this night of ours! The Baku will not even have time to eat our dreams. Old Japanese love song. The name of the creature is Baku, or Shirokina Katsukami, and its particular function is the eating of dreams. It is variously represented and described an ancient book in my possession states that the male baku has the body of a horse the face of a lion the trunk and tusks of an elephant the forelock of a rhinoceros the tail of a cow and the feet of a tiger the female baku is said to differ greatly in shape from the male but the difference is not clearly set forth in the time of the old chinese learning pictures of the baku used to be hung up in japanese houses such pictures being supposed to exert the same beneficent power as the creature itself my ancient book contains this legend about the custom in the chaussee roku it is declared that kote while hunting on the eastern coast once met with a baku having the body of an animal but speaking like a man kote said since the world is quiet and at peace why should we still see goblins if a baku be needed to extinguish evil sprites then it were better to have a picture of a baku suspended to the wall of one's house thereafter even though some evil wonder should appear it could do no harm then there is given a long list of evil wonders and the signs of their presence when the hen lays a soft egg the demon's name is taifu when snakes appear entwined together the demon's name is jinsu when dogs go with their ears turned back the demon's name is tayo when the fox speaks with the voice of a man the demon's name is guashu 
when blood appears on the clothes of men the demon's name is yuki when the rice pot speaks with a human voice the demon's name is kanjo when the dream of the night is an evil dream the demon's name is ringetsu and the old book further observes whenever any such evil marvel happens let the name of the baku be invoked then the evil sprite will immediately sink three feet under the ground but on the subject of evil wonders i do not feel qualified to discourse it belongs to the unexplored and appalling world of chinese demonology and it has really very little to do with the subject of the baku in japan the japanese baku is commonly known only as the eater of dreams and the most remarkable fact in relation to the cult of the creature is that the chinese character representing its name used to be put in gold upon the lacquered wooden pillows of lords and princes by the virtue and power of this character on the pillow the sleeper was thought to be protected from evil dreams it is rather difficult to find such a pillow to-day even pictures of the baku or hakutaku as it is sometimes called have become very rare but the old invocation to the baku still survives in common parlance baku kurai baku kurai baku kurai devour o baku devour my evil dream when you awake from a nightmare or from any unlucky dream you should quickly repeat that invocation three times then the baku will eat the dream and will change the misfortune or the fear into good fortune and gladness it was on a very sultry night during the period of greatest heat that i last saw the baku i had just awakened out of misery and the hour was the hour of the ox and the baku came in through the window to ask have you anything for me to eat i gratefully made answer assuredly listen good baku to this dream of mine i was standing in some great white-walled room where lamps were burning but i cast no shadow on the naked floor of that room and there upon an iron bed i saw my own dead body how i had come to die and when i had died i could not remember women were sitting near the bed six or seven and i did not know any of them they were neither young nor old and all were dressed in black watchers i took them to be they sat motionless and silent there was no sound in the place and i somehow felt that the hour was late in the same moment i became aware of something nameless in the atmosphere of the room a heaviness that weighed upon the will some viewless numbing power that was slowly growing then the watchers began to watch each other stealthily and i knew that they were afraid soundlessly one rose up and left the room another followed then another so one by one and lightly as shadows they all went out i was left alone with the corpse of myself the lamps still burned clearly but the terror in the air was thickening the watchers had stolen away almost as soon as they began to feel it but i believed that there was yet time to escape i thought that i could safely delay a moment longer a monstrous curiosity obliged me to remain i wanted to look at my own body to examine it closely i approached it i observed it and i wondered because it seemed to me very long unnaturally long then i thought that i saw one eyelid quiver but the appearance of motion might have been caused by the trembling of a lamp flame i stooped to look slowly and very cautiously because i was afraid that the eyes might open it is myself i thought as i bent down and yet it is growing queer the face appeared to be lengthening it is not myself i thought again as i stooped still lower and yet it cannot be any other and i became much more afraid unspeakably afraid that the eyes would open they opened horribly they opened and that thing sprang 
sprang from the bed at me and fastened upon me moaning and gnawing and rending oh with what madness of terror did i strive against it but the eyes of it and the moans of it and the touch of it sickened and all my being seemed about to burst asunder in frenzy of loathing when i knew not how i found in my hand an axe and i struck with the axe i clove i crushed i brayed the moaner until there lay before me only a shapeless hideous reeking mass the abominable ruin of myself baku kore baku kore baku kore devour o oh, baku devour the dream nay made answer the baku i never eat lucky dreams that is a very lucky dream a most fortunate dream the axe yes the axe of the excellent law by which the monster of self is utterly destroyed the best kind of a dream my friend i believe in the teaching of the buddha and the baku went out of the window i looked after him and i beheld him fleeing over the miles of moonlit roofs passing from housetop to housetop with amazing soundless leaps like a great cat End of the Eater of Dreams by Lafcadio Hearn Eating in Berlin by Irvin S. Cobb This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Reading by Matt Perroy. Eating in Berlin by Irvin S. Cobb a humorous view of the natives wonderful appetites the average berliner has a double chin running all the way around and four rolls of fat on the back of his neck all closely clipped and shaved so as to bring out their full beauty and symmetry and he has a figure that makes him look as though an earthquake had shaken loose everything on the top floor and it had all fallen through into his dining room your true berliner eats his regular daily meals four in number and all large ones and in between times he now and then gathers a bite for instance about ten o'clock in the morning he knocks off for an hour and has a few cups of hard-boiled coffee and some sweet sticky pastry with whipped cream on it then about four o'clock in the afternoon he browses a bit just to keep up his appetite for dinner this though is but a snack say a school of bismarck herring and a crump pie some more coffee and more cake and one thing and another merely a preliminary to the real food which will be coming along a little later on between acts at the theater he excuses himself and goes out and prepares his stomach for supper which will follow at eleven o'clock by drinking two or three steins of thick munich beer and nibbling on such small tidbits as a few lengths of german sausage or the upper half of a raw westphalia ham there are forty-seven distinct and separate varieties of german sausage and three of them are edible but the westphalia ham in my judgment is greatly overrated it is pronounced west failure with the accent on the last part where it belongs in germany however there is a pheasant agreeably smothered in young cabbage which is delicious and in season plentiful the only drawback to complete enjoyment of this dish is that the grasping and avaricious german restaurant keeper has the confounded nerve to charge you in our money forty cents for a whole pheasant and half a peck of cabbage say enough to furnish a full meal for two tolerably hungry adults and a child End of eating in berlin by Irvin s cobb from the Saturday Evening Post of 1914. From Rose Petals to Rose Oil 
a selection from the rose its history published by petko and orozov shippers and distillers of genuine bulgarian otto of rose 1908 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the famous rose gardens of persia were situated in the neighborhood of shiraz the roses grown here being said by kempfer to excel in profusion and fragrance those of any other locality in persia as we speak of the rose as the queen of flowers so in persia it is called gul that is the flower without further gratification the discovery of the separation of the essential oil from the distillation water appears to have been made in or about fifteen seventy four by one geronimo rossi it is also described in fifteen eighty nine by porta again by sula in sixteen ten from persia the industry of distillation spread to india but so far as we are concerned the only important development is that which spread to the famous rose gardens of the world bulgaria it is about two hundred and twenty years ago that the culture of the rose was introduced into bulgaria then known as eastern rumelia by a turkish merchant the industry was also taken from the african coast to provence today we find the cultivation of the rose established also to some extent in germany tunis algeria egypt and morocco to secure the most successful results in the culture of the rose several conditions are essential the soil should be easily permeable to water hence the sandy slopes of the southern sides of the balkans are so favorable to good growth plenty of fuel and water in the immediate locality is an essential for good results as the flowers must be distilled very soon after they are picked in bulgaria the rose bushes are planted close together forming compact hedges in rows of about fifty to one hundred yards in length the full height of the mature plant is six to seven feet between each row a space of about six feet is left allowing two men to walk abreast the rose cultivated for otto in bulgaria is a variety of rosa damascena the red damask rose it is to be distinguished from the english cabbage rose provence rose rosa centifolia which is cultivated for rose perfume in the south of france by the greater size of its spines its green bark elongated fruit and longer reflexed sepals its tendency to develop a second crop of flowers in november exemplifies the tendency which all the descendants of rosa centifolia have to revert to the original type it will not be necessary for us to enter into any details of the cultivation of the flower in germany or france as what little otto is produced in these countries is absorbed locally in the main and the world depends essentially for its supply on the bulgarian output we may therefore now pass on to the harvesting and distillation in very hot summers the harvesting takes place most rapidly and the whole of the plants may complete their flowering in from fourteen to twenty days but in more normal seasons with moderate temperatures and warm frequent rains the harvest may last a full month the time of the rose gathering in normal years lies between the fifteenth and twenty-fifth of may and finishes about the middle of june such normal harvests are by far the most profitable to the distillers and the otto produced is probably of finer quality than when the distillation has to be forced along too rapidly for example if a rapid harvest takes place lasting only fourteen days the same number of stills will have to deal with twice the weight of flowers per day that have to be treated in a harvest lasting a month and the risk of burning the flowers and so imparting a bad odor to the otto is great 
women and children usually gather the flowers and picking commences at daybreak the flowers are picked with their sepals on and those are not separated at all the whole flower being distilled roughly one thousand roses weigh one kilogram and a hectare about two point five acres yields about three million flowers which yield in their turn about one kilo of otto thus it takes about one hundred thousand roses to yield an ounce of otto every open or half-opened flower is gathered frequently when the early morning dew is on them as it is most important that they should not be gathered whilst the heat of the sun is on them picking usually continues till ten or eleven o'clock or if the day be cloudy till considerably later roses gathered when the sun is hot on them have a comparatively feeble odour and yield much less otto the flowers are carried as quickly as possible to the distilleries where they are distilled as rapidly as possible in times of very rapid harvests the flowers come in too rapidly and the flowers may often be left twenty-four hours before being distilled when such is the case much loss is occasioned as the flowers deteriorate and lose their fragrance and often begin to ferment thus yielding a much inferior otto the obstruction at the distillery owing to the number of flowers may even be so great that all the flowers cannot possibly be distilled and may have to be thrown away the few large distilleries not only distill their own roses but buy all those of the immediate neighborhood from peasant growers who have not the good fortune to possess a still the lack of water is another frequent reason why a peasant has to sell his flowers as distillation is then impossible the stills are built up under rough wooden sheds open on one side there may be one or two in a peasant's distillery or a large number in a row in the case of the merchant distiller the condensation water is in the more primitive distilleries led by a wooden gutter fixed to the roof and as it passes each of the condensing tubs it gives a supply of cold water to each condenser it is obvious that the best position for the distilling sheds is near a watercourse in the poorer peasants farms the distillation sheds are merely temporary thatched huts put up to last the harvest time the absence of a water supply of course forces a peasant to sell his harvest to the nearest distillery the stills or alembics are made of sheet copper and are in the shape of a truncated cone the body is about three feet six inches in height consisting of a bottom piece and a superimposed portion joined at the middle by a tin band the diameter of the body at this point is about two feet eight inches the diameter of the neck is about ten inches the head somewhat resembles the shape of a mushroom and is about twelve inches in height from this head a straight inclined tube leads to a worm condenser in a tub of cold water the average contents of a still are about twenty gallons the charge usually being about ten kilos of flowers and seventy-five liters of water a brisk fire is kept up for an hour or two and when ten liters of the liquid have been distilled over the fire is drawn at times fifteen liters are distilled but the resulting otto then sometimes contains more steroptine than usual the still is then opened and the exhausted flowers are thrown away and the residual hot water made up to seventy-five liters with cold water is returned to the still with a fresh charge of flowers the operation is repeated until about forty liters of distillate are collected this is now redistilled and the first five liters collected in a long-necked flask the remaining thirty-five liters are used for distilling again with fresh flowers the five liters collected are allowed to stand and the otto floating on the surface 
collects in the neck of the flask from which it is removed by a tiny tin funnel with a very small orifice to allow the water to drain away it cannot be denied that this method of treating so delicate a flower as the rose by distillation over a naked fire is very primitive and little short of barbarous but there is no doubt that as the conditions become more favorable more scientific methods of distillation will be adopted the details of the distillation are of course varied but the only important variation to which attention need be called is that by which the so-called green otto is obtained this otto is of a greenish color and is said to be obtained by allowing the first distillation waters to stand and the oil floating on the surface is separated without any further distillation of the water at one time it was a common practice to sprinkle the leaves with so-called turkish geranium oil and so obtain a high yield of otto heavily adulterated such practices are of course still common but today one can say with certainty that there are many honest distillers of otto of rose in bulgaria so much for the harvesting and distillation of the otto it is not necessary to deal with the manner in which these operations are carried out in other countries as their importance in the otto of rose trade is quite insignificant as compared with that of bulgaria End of from rose petals to rose oil an excerpt from the rose its history published by petko and orozov shippers and distillers of genuine bulgarian otto of rose 1908 read for librivox by sue anderson john johnston of sue st marie a passage in canadian history by william kingsford ottawa this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org there are many facts that have a bearing upon history which should be preserved by those who learn them for what is history but a generalization of several minor narratives turned into one main line of record there is much in the lives of even the most commonplace which is useful under this aspect and if care be taken in obtaining the facts correctly when these several records are grouped together we have the means of honestly representing a past condition of events and so profiting by their teaching there is no particular lesson to be learned in the career of mr johnston useful and honourable as it was but there is much in the opinion of the writer worth perpetuating he has accordingly thrown together the short narrative which follows from papers placed in his hands which he believes contain only what is well founded and true he trusts that it may obtain attention and be held of value by those who may read it it may be a slight but it is certainly a positive contribution to history as setting forth the early settlement of the town of sault st marie and being the forerunner of its present characteristic as a depot of indian trade it was only a few years ago that it was the ultima thule of civilization the red river settlement established by lord selkirk in eighteen twenty one was far removed from the sioux indeed at that date it was supplied as a rule from the north by way of york on hudson bay and the nelson river the old canoe route by the commenced aquia to the height of land and by the lakes shabandoan and kashabwe and crossing the watershed by the waters which led to rainy lake and the lake of the woods this route was known but was not used as the ordinary means of communication with fort garry now winnipeg for canada the sault st marie was until the last few years the end of civilization and we proceed to give the life of one of its principal founders mr john johnston was born in the north of ireland of a family of high respectability he held in his own right the estate of craig near colrain not far from the giant's causeway his father a civil engineer planned and executed the waterworks at belfast 
his mother was the sister of lady mary sarin wife of bishop sarin bishop of dromore her brother being at the time attorney-general of ireland we cannot tell the precise period of his birth but he was a young man when in seventeen ninety public attention in england was strongly directed to canada in seventeen seventy four what is known as the quebec acts were passed by the imperial parliament one established the province of quebec with a constitution and a form of government the second dealt with the revenue and means of meeting its expenses in the intervening period between the conquest and this date the country had been governed in accordance with the letter of the royal proclamation and some anxiety was felt as to its scope and power the english settler required english liberty the french canadian except with some rare exceptions was literally without ideas of political freedom and his own personal life was so trammelled that restraint was to him a normal condition of being he looked with extreme suspicion on any change and however much he felt the onerous nature of his old government the distrust that he felt with regard to the new order of things led him to look with disfavour on the changes which had only in view the common advancement and prosperity of the whole people the english settler on the other hand desired a continuance of the political liberty imperfect as it was viewed by modern theories which he held as his birthright in criminal law there was little divergence of thought the french canadian early saw the fairer and more liberal nature of the new system even with its imperfections of that time in the laws of property and government there was no concord in the meantime the american revolution had commenced and ended with the loss of the old colonies the quebec act therefore was looked upon unfavorably and in seventeen ninety one the canada act was passed which divided the provinces into upper and lower canada and remained in operation half a century lord dorchester was the governor and no less a person than the duke of kent then colonel of the seventh fusiliers arrived in quebec in august of that year as ninety years later we speak of the gracious and honoured lady now amongst us as the princess her grandfather was at that date the prince doing his duty as an officer of the garrison no doubt a great impulse was given at home to any proposition to emigrate to canada mr johnston was somewhere about twenty-one when the events we sketch were occurring and doubtless they had no little influence on his life for in seventeen ninety two he arrived in the country he was the bearer of letters of introduction to lord dorchester and became his guest and thus obtained a passport into the best society of the place it was under these favourable auspices that he became acquainted with some of the leading members of the northwest company and he received an invitation from them to visit their headquarters in montreal these were the halcyon days of the northwest company the fur trade had completely recovered from the blow it received at the conquest until seventeen fifty five or so the west had been greatly under the control of the french in canada and the succeeding wars and the reverses which changed the fate of french canada had caused it to languish after the conquest it fell into british hands and for a time became greatly narrowed the indians had been taught to look with suspicion on the british their sympathies were entirely french and hence they were disinclined to enter into new arrangements with the newcomers in a few years after the establishment of the new order of things the trade had re-established itself it was however more the proceeding of individual effort than of an organized company there were to be met accordingly all the artifices of competition according to the scruples of those who practised them there was the usual effort of traders to outbid each other liquor which the french prohibited had been introduced to the ruin of the indian the scenes which took place after the frequent orgies were marked by all the repellent features which accompanied besotted and quarrelsome drunkenness and in addition to this dark condition of the traffic feuds broke out when rival traders met ending not unfrequently in bloodshed two parties representing opposite interests crossing a common path each had to trade in the heart of the wilderness where law was unknown 
power fell often to those who in a pitched fight proved the strongest to end a condition of affairs which even in its commercial aspect threatened only ruin some merchants of montreal in 1783 entered into a partnership a few years after some of these partnerships were extended and in 1787 the celebrated northwest company was formed it then consisted of twenty-three partners but its staff of agents factors clerks guides interpreters and voyageurs amounted to two thousand persons the heads of this company were in full ascendancy when mr johnston reached canada they affected a profuse hospitality not merely aided by large resources but they endeavored to mark it by refinement and elegance their entertainments were alluded to by washington irving who as yet a stripling youth sat at the hospitable boards of the mighty northwesters the lords of the ascendant at montreal and gazed with wondering and inexperienced eye at the baronial wassailing and listened with astonished ear to their talks of hardships and distress the names of the mctavishes mcgilvries and the mackenzies are still remembered and representatives of their families are constantly to be met in those days the leading partners of the great northwest were among the magnates of society and it was in this entourage that mr johnston was thrown when he had to determine the course of his future life it was under this influence that his mind was excited by the descriptions given of the indian trade and he imagined that he saw in its lucrative enterprises a field for his exertions he accordingly determined to visit sault st marie a journey of a very different character to that taken by the modern traveller the trader from montreal nowadays reaches sarnia in twenty-four hours and taking a beady steamer reaches the sioux by nightfall that is to say he makes the sioux in seventy-two hours at that date the ottawa was the channel of communication the present generation see little realism in moore's boat song of row brothers row but at the date we speak of it described a well-known phase of voyageur life st anne's rapid now spanned by the grand trunk bridge was the first rapid met by the expedition on leaving lachine the course taken was to follow the ottawa to the matawan which was ascended to its source where the waters falling into lake huron were followed and the passage to the sioux was then made in quiet water the journey took several weeks arrived at lake superior mr johnston commenced prospecting for a habitation he finally selected la pointe on the south shore of lake superior and he determined to establish himself there to purchase furs and to pay for them by goods he obtained his supplies at montreal from the mercantile houses there among whom the then well-known hebrew firm of david davids and company prominently figured and he had settled himself down in this wilderness to live an indian life to trade in what the region produced and to reap some of those profits which had so fired his imagination the indian chief who was all-powerful in this region was named wabaji the white fisher his power extended by all accounts down to the falls of st anthony on the mississippi his wigwam was then at la pointe as the fairy tale says this chief had one lovely daughter osha gush kadakwa the woman of the green mountain and as a matter of course the trader saw and loved mr johnston found doubtless the solitude of his life not always pleasant he had been accustomed to society and hence he sighed for companionship one fact however is evident he was not looked upon as a jeune homme à mari we can find here no trace of mature feminine scheming to obtain a bon parti we leave out of sight the history of the courtship but there can be little doubt that when the indian chief received the proposition of the newcomer he looked upon it with some suspicion the tradition is preserved in the family that the old chief recalled the fact that many white traders had visited the west and obtained young squaws as their wives and had often deserted them and their children leaving the whole behind or brought them to civilization to treat them with cruelty and disregard steele's exquisitely told tale in the spectator of Inkle and yoris we fear has many a prototype 
we have lying before us a speech of the chief which we are assured has been preserved in the family and is considered in every sense genuine young man you have come across the great salt lake and found your way to my country you have told us that it is your intention to remain here and to open an honourable trade with us giving us such goods as we require in exchange for our furs you further say that you intend to enlarge your trade and to enable you to do so you will visit your native land and carry out your intentions during your absence i will think over your proposal for my daughter and if when you return you are in the same mind i will then decide as to your marriage accordingly there was no alternative but patience mr johnston left la pointe and returned to ireland he sold his estate of craig and with the money he received increased his operations a year elapsed before he was back at lake superior when his offer of marriage was again urged the chief it would seem held that there was proof sufficient of fidelity and his consent was given the lady with the difficult name became mrs johnston bringing with her all the traditions of her ancient indian lineage and birth and there is every reason to think that no one of the parties whose happiness was dependent on this connection ever looked upon it but with fondness and trust wabaji the indian chief in question was a man of no ordinary character like most of his race his feelings and sympathies were with the french the influence obtained by the french was remarkable but it can be explained the jesuit priest on one hand went amongst them and taught them a religion adapted to their intellect it was accompanied by a pageantry which the indian love of display could appreciate the objective side of roman catholicism in its ceremonies and rites must always be powerful to take the imagination of those who require to be led and controlled while the philosophic arguments of protestants exact seriousness sobriety of thought and reflection to master and to accept we can account for the success of messieurs moody and sankey by the appeal to the imagination and feeling and by inculcating the necessity of earnest prayer as something tangible and plain and of making imperative the duty of singing as an act of worship hymns which partake much of the character of the music hall a man will make an effort for his religion of this kind which really involves little abnegation and self-sacrifice and he is easily cheated into the belief that he is religious and devout that religion which makes unselfish duty to your neighbour and forgiveness of injury a primary principle must often appear too abstract and impossible and too little emotional the jesuit by the contrary course obtained the full confidence of the tribes whom he placed in subjection to his rule there was another element in the popularity of the french the coureur de bois became in most cases a part of indian life he married a squaw and adopted the customs of the people he sunk to their level and assumed their habits the english traders on the other hand were it is feared more frequently guilty of conduct which awoke the chief's suspicion when his daughter was asked in marriage news in those days travelled slowly but nevertheless they did travel and the report reached wabaji that his old friends and allies were sorely pressed by the bastonnais before quebec his duty was plain to him he summoned his braves and prepared without delay to go to the assistance of his old friends and allies he started and reached quebec to take part in the final struggle and to see their power for ever broken thirty years had passed since that date and he had learned in the interval to accept the new order of things mr johnston's life passed quietly on he found the sioux better adapted for his operations and accordingly he moved there and established the trade which has since increased to make the sioux the favourite place it now is he lived there in a free hospitable way his life was happy he had in the course of time eight children and his own leisure and what aid he could obtain were given to the education of his four sons and four daughters he was a justice of the peace and he was living a useful patriarchal life when the war of eighteen twelve broke out one of the earliest plans which the genius of brock had conceived was the taking of michamillimackinac 
this post which is situated in the straits of mackinaw on the north of the great peninsula dividing lake huron and mackinaw had been held during the war of independence by an english garrison and on the establishment of the boundary was surrendered to the united states the fort was one of importance for before the days of steam it commanded the entrance into lake michigan on its transfer a military post had been established on the canadian island of st joseph over fifty miles to the northeast without delay when war was declared brock directed captain roberts who was the commandant at st joseph to take possession of michamillimackinac on receiving his instructions roberts started the following morning and the place which was feebly garrisoned capitulated without a blow the surrender of detroit by the americans on august sixteenth eighteen twelve made an effort to retake it impossible but in eighteen fourteen the united states fitted out an expedition to regain it but the station had been reinforced by the way of natawasaga in may the garrison was even able to be aggressive and a detachment was detailed for the purpose of attacking prairie du chaine on the mississippi which was taken and the gunboat which lay there was forced to descend the stream mackinaw was too important a position for the united states to have in an enemy's possession and a force under the command of lieutenant colonel grogan was sent to retake it an event which had the most disastrous effect on mr johnston's fortunes colonel mcdowell who commanded the british garrison felt that he had no ordinary task before him and accordingly sent to mr johnston an urgent appeal for assistance the distance from st joseph's to the sioux is but trifling and in quiet water is passed over by a canoe in a few hours colonel mcdowell's appeal to mr johnston was to bring with him all the men at his command and at this season he had a large force devoted to the mother country to his mind there was only one course to which honor and duty pointed he called his men together about one hundred as rapidly as possible provisioned them and armed them at his own cost and embarking on two large bateaux proceeded to michamillimackinac the american commandant no doubt fearing a proceeding of this character or having received intelligence of the reinforcement dispatched two armed gunboats with a force under major holmes to intercept it there are two channels to the sioux one now followed which passes by the nebish rapids and lake george bound on the east by sugar island and the st mary's river the second channel leaves the sioux and passes to the west of sugar island by hay and mud lakes whatever the cause the united states gunboats failed to intercept the relief it is no unfair inference that johnston's prudence suggested to him to take the more difficult and less known route to the men of his party a matter of little moment to the united states commander it was a serious necessity to follow the known channel mr johnston took with him his second son george and arrived safely at mackinaw his eldest son a lieutenant in the navy was then a prisoner at cincinnati the united states expedition proceeded to the sioux there was no force to oppose them the powerless women and children could only look on while major holmes plundered johnston hall as there was no fighting there was loot the memorandum placed in the hands of the writer runs to the effect that major holmes and his men took everything of value plate linen and wearing apparel and plentifully supplied themselves with provisions they tore up the floor to see what articles of value were concealed the stores were filled with goods for distribution among the indians many of the bales not having been opened everything that was possible to put on board the gunboats was placed there there was cloth of a finer description its ultimate destination was the united states flagship niagara where it was divided amongst the officers and men on the arrival of the force mrs johnston and her children fled to the woods she remained there while the enemy was in possession of the property supporting herself on roots and what she could obtain christie in his history relates that many of the buildings were reduced to ashes mcmullen tells us that in this raid where there was not a single military man all the horses and cattle were killed and the provisions and garden stuff which could not be removed destroyed major holmes returned to join in the assault it was made on the fourth of august 
but it ignominiously failed the expedition re-embarking leaving seventeen men dead on the shore among them major holmes his sword was taken from his side and presented to the second son of the unprotected household he had plundered the danger at Mishamillimackinac over mr johnston returned to the wreck of his property his loss was considerable his trade had been extensive and his private means which were sufficiently ample had obtained for him much of the luxury which refined wealth can command in a few hours the whole had been irretrievably destroyed it was useless however to count the cost the duty of the hour was to repair the injury mr johnston was in no way unequal to the occasion with his old energy and ability he commenced his business but the check it received and the competition which arose prevented it ever again taking its old form or attaining its former extent at the close of the war mr johnston applied for compensation for his losses which must have been very heavy he himself estimated his loss at many thousands of pounds these war losses were one of the vexed questions of the day and remained the source of trouble for years it was mr johnston's fortune never to obtain recognition he received nothing there is little doubt that this treatment preyed on his mind and impaired his health his nature was exceedingly sensitive and he could not but feel the ill requital of his services and the injustice with which his claim for indemnity had been received but his usefulness was not yet a thing of the past we cannot enter here into the difficulties which existed between the two rival companies of the northwest and the hudson's bay company but when an amicable arrangement was made he acted as a commissioner in adjustment of the points in dispute and greatly aided in the settlement secured in eighteen twenty one when a coalition of the two companies was effected he returned to toronto then york where he was the guest of the lieutenant governor sir peregrine maitland subsequently with mrs johnston he revisited the mother country and his eldest daughter jane a young girl of surpassing beauty and of great sweetness of disposition then twelve years of age accompanied him in england both the duke and duchess of northumberland were so charmed with her that they desired to adopt her and make her their heir mr johnston did not feel justified in accepting their offer after a year's residence he returned to canada with his family against the wishes of his friends who were desirous that his daughter should remain to complete her education but he felt that her fortunes were in canada and hence that her presence was called for there mr johnston was always a man of strong religious convictions so far as in him lay he had given a sound education to his children and the sunday had been observed at the sioux by such observances as he could command he himself generally reading the service of the church of england and a sermon or homily and his room was open to all who saw fit to attend when in england he engaged a clergyman to come out with him but at quebec the new incumbent of sioux st marie heard such accounts of what was then the far west that he declined to proceed there mr johnston had himself to carry on the duty of assembling with his family all who were willing to attend such ministrations as he could give he was a man of sincere piety and of unblemished life and well educated he continued his course of duty till his death which occurred in eighteen twenty eight after an attack of typhoid fever the family tradition is that the treatment he received on the conclusion of the war permanently affected his health and strength of his children lewis the eldest son held the appointment of lieutenant in the navy and served on board the queen charlotte at the period of the defeat of the british squadron by commodore perry in which he was seriously wounded he was taken prisoner and sent to cincinnati where with several others he received severe treatment his family assert that from this he never recovered after the war he held an appointment in the indian department till his death he was buried at amherstburg with military honors the eldest daughter jane already spoken of as attracting great attention in england became the wife of henry rowe schoolcraft the united states indian agent at sault st marie known as the author of the history of the indians of north america published by the united states government the immense cost of this publication six hundred and fifty thousand dollars attracted considerable attention at the time 
but the book is a valuable addition to indian archaeology mrs schoolcraft was a woman of culture some of her fugitive poems being of a high order the second daughter eliza now seventy-eight years of age never married we believe and is still living at the sioux the third daughter married archdeacon mcmurray of niagara at the time of her marriage september eighteen thirty three her husband was missionary to the indians on the north shores of lakes huron and superior being the first clergyman who performed that duty she died at niagara in january eighteen seventy eight maria the youngest daughter married james lawrence schoolcraft brother of her elder sister's husband both are dead the three sons of mr johnston have also passed away excepting john mcdowell johnston who resides at the sioux on the american shore end of john johnston of sioux st marie a passage in canadian history by william kingsford ottawa read by phil schampf